Amen, amen. So we're going to pray. Can we do that right now in this room? Father, we come to you. We're grateful and thankful that you, oh God, are here with us today. That in your presence anything can take place. Anything, anything. My God, you see every heart here. You see every, every individual. You know exactly what they need to hear, God. And so I pray that you would anoint these lips of clay. Oh God, to speak your word, declare things to people that need to hear. My God, let revelation, oh God, understanding, oh God, just fill this house today. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, it's good to be here on September the 3rd. I didn't realize how privileged I was. Uh, it took me many years to finally figure it out. Uh, I should have known right from the start. Uh, I don't believe I ever really thanked my father and mother for for the times that they prayed and for the atmosphere that they had created in the home that I lived in. Uh, I wish I could tell them that today, but of course they're it's not possible, physically possible, to say that to them today. But I was raised in a very, very godly environment. Uh, I knew my mother never, ever wore a pair of slacks in, in, in my life. Ah, all right. There was no television in our home. You may think that was boring, but my God, huh? I learned how to read. Praise God. I hid, I hid the Hardy Boys. And, and some of you don't even know what the Hardy Boys are. Yeah, I read all of their, all of their, uh, all of their books, man. Just, amen. And then when I wasn't doing that, my, I had an open field outside, amen, where we could make forts and play army and do all kinds of stuff. And then the kindness of my father, he had bought us a horse, amen, and so I learned to ride that horse. Amen. Ride on a pony, or I guess that's what Thunder was, was a pony. Amen. We had a two-wheeled cart. I learned how to put, hook that up to it and run down the street. We lived in the county, so, I mean, there was no problem with us being on the, on the, the roads with the horse. Amen. But those were great times. But I just, I didn't realize, I didn't realize the impact that they had upon me in ways that are not necessarily tangible to the individual. Why, why at the early age was I concerned about the coming of the Lord? I wasn't even 10 years old and I was concerned about Jesus coming. I wasn't even 10 years old and I, I knew that if Jesus come, Brother Leo, this old cantankerous little fella, amen, who stole and lied, amen, and that's what he did, amen, uh, was not going to go to heaven. And if you're doing that today, you ain't going either. All right, you hear me? Amen. This, is, this may be a picnic, but I didn't come to picnic. All right. Amen. And so, uh, my God. So the conviction was in my life from very early, very early. Uh, amen. And uh, I, I never, never... Uh, my mother was respectful to my father. If you wives aren't respectful to your husband, you are promoting things that are not of God. All right? I mean, I'm just... <clears throat> That's quiet, man. I, I, maybe I ought to go to... Maybe I ought to leave for the picnic right now. Huh? And uh, my, my father was very respectful to my mother. In fact, on Sundays was her day off. <laughs> and so on her day off, we always went out to eat. And I know it's a, a famous place today, but we used to go to Frank's Diners when they, they did more than breakfast, man. I went there when the actually original owners were there, and I can even remember their names. Bud was the cook, and Florence and Lorraine, amen, they were the waitresses. And, and I, my, my favorite food on a Sunday was, was a breaded veal cutlet with mashed potatoes and gravy and a vegetable. And then I had some kind of a soda. And believe it or not, the four of us, my brother and I, my mom and dad, it would cost us less than 10 bucks. Now, that's what I'm talking about. Wow, is right. <laughs> my God. They, they, should have adapt, they should have adapted the slogan that McDonald's used to have, you know. You get change back. 
not anymore. But anyways, so I, I, didn't, I didn't realize how rich I was in, in the things of God. I, I didn't realize, I didn't understand. I didn't understand that underlying influence of God that was speaking to me when I wasn't speaking to Him. I, I, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Amen. And I remember getting the Holy Ghost at the age of nine. Anybody here is nine years old? Amen. I, I, got the Holy, I got the Holy Ghost when I was nine, man. Amen. And, and I was worried about Jesus coming and, and things weren't looking so good. And Amen. That was back during the, and most of you don't know it, you got to be my age or older, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Amen. The what? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You didn't know anything about the Cuban Missile Crisis, though. Huh? Amen. And uh, war was beginning to ratchet up. I'm telling you, it was getting tense. You know, and, and, and I knew. I was, my God. Most of the kids here, no, no, this, they have absolutely no fear of the coming of God. Nor are they aware that He's coming. They, 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 don't, they don't believe that He could come today. They just, huh? What are you, what are you talking about? But that, that was the atmosphere that I was raised in. No, I, I didn't. It didn't mess my brain up. It didn't didn't make me goofy. Hallelujah! I've got a healthy family. I got healthy grandkids. My God, we're not a bunch of neurotics. Amen. They ain't, they ain't going to see the doctor to get their head on straight. Amen. You know, I know we're, we're we're fine. We're fine. You know, so don't don't tell me walking with God, Amen, messes you up because you you just wrong. In fact, you're flat out crazy. All right. And so that, that, was, that was the atmosphere that, that I was in. I, I still remember to this day, my, my, my twin brother Tim was mentally handicapped. Uh, he used to have violent grand mal seizures. If you've never seen somebody have a grand mal seizure, it's, it's, it's a very frightening thing. Amen. To see them just come off of a chair and get rigid and, and kick, and you're trying to hold them to keep them from hurting themselves. A uh, violent, you know, the face sometimes will just turn blue. It's like they're not getting any oxygen. It's, it's ugly. And, and my brother used to have them uh, quite frequently in, when we were teenagers. And, you know, he, he would drive me crazy. We had a room together. He used, to, he used to love to play records. And I think I've told you this. Louis Armstrong. Hello, Dally. This is, I get tired of hearing about Louis, man. He, he had it, now you're not even going to know what this says. He had it on a 45. And you say, what? He had a gun? No, a, a 45. Oh, that, oh, for you that don't know, that's a record. There were 33 and a half, 45, 78s. My brother had it, man. We didn't, we didn't know what a cassette was. We didn't even know what an 8-track was. You said, an 8-track? What's an 8-track? That's what I'm talking about. The MP3s, and you're way beyond that now. But, uh, you know, and, and he drive me crazy. And, and we, uh, you know, we, we'd be, I'd be laying there sleeping during the night. And I'd wake up because in the room was very strong praying going on. And I would wake up and I would look to where my brother would be laying. And I'd know there was some disturbance there. Amen. My mother and father would be in that room on their knees seeking God for him. Hallelujah. I didn't understand how powerful that influence was. I didn't realize just how rich I was in things that are, are, are so grand and so right. Amen. I, I didn't realize. I, I was very foolish. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't understand the value of, of those things. I do now. Mom and Dad... You need to create an atmosphere in your home that is holy and righteous. There ought not to be swearing in your home. There ought to be respect and love in your home. People ought not to be losing their mind in your home. You know what I mean by losing your mind? That ought not to be happening in our homes. And if your home is like that, well then you need to do something about it. You don't need a doctor, you need Jesus. All right, that's what you need. You need Jesus. And if you don't think that's right, then, well, then just, what's it done for you so far, the way you've been living, huh? Tell me how it's, what it's done in your life. Tell me how good it's been. You need Jesus. 
And so just, I just, my God, it's, it was so precious. Amen. So precious. And, and uh, uh, that's what God called me at a young age. I didn't realize it at that time. And, and just, so I've been around this. I've been around God all, I, I'm so comfortable with what's happened today. I didn't get nervous when God shows up. Amen. And, and he, he don't inform me what he's going to do. Which is fine with me. You just do your thing, God. And I'll just, if we're going that way, that, then we're going that way, God. And, this, and, and so he, he's so wonderful. So, so majestic. You know, we're craving the wrong stuff, brothers and sisters. We ought to be craving the presence of God. We ought to be desiring to be in his presence. You see, you, you can't live in two worlds. You can't have God and then have the world and think it's going to work out. It's never going to work out. You'll find yourself hating the things of God and excusing what you're doing and justifying your unrighteousness. And so, you know, this, is not, this is my introduction, man. And Notice I didn't start with a verse. So God help us all. Amen. Okay, time's flying. Time's flying. So, so I was so blessed. So blessed to hear the name of Jesus called to sit at a table and have supper and my mother and father were there and amen there would there would be prayer and there'd be joking and just didn't sometimes there wasn't joking but it was great and again it it has shaped me and formed me to who i am today it really has amen uh some some of you parents that you deal with kids like me it just I, I tell you have hope you just keep doing what God wants you to do. You just keep serving God. You just keep creating an atmosphere of righteousness in your home. I just, just have hope. Because I, was, I got goofy. I can just tell you that. And I was raised in, in righteousness. And, you know, I, I knew the difference between right and wrong. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't have to scratch my head and say, oh, you mean that's wrong? No, I knew it was wrong. But I just, I went the wrong direction in my life, you know. But there were some things that had been placed in me. There were some influences that no matter where I went, whether I went to a bar, whether I was hanging out with a bunch of guys that were womanizing, whatever I was doing, there was an influence on me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I'm come to preach about that influence today. Hmm. I've come to tell you something that's real good, and, and some of you need to catch on. Some of you kids that think you're, because your parents make you come to church, they're, they're so cruel to you, and they want you to pray, and you, you just don't get it. I, I'll tell you what your problem is. You can't see past the end of your nose. All right? You don't understand that in this world, we're going to die. And the question is, are we going to live for God or are we going to live for the devil? And I'm here to tell you, if you die twice, which means you've been born again, you, you, you only can die once. But if you've died once, man, you're going to die twice. All right? So here we are. Here we are. Hallelujah. So there's, there's this tremendous presence of God. And, and, and some of you, I, I, before this message, I'm going to give you some hope. Some of you that are struggling here this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Acts 27, the Apostle Paul is making a journey. He's making that journey by, uh, well, he, he's under guard. He's under guard, and he's, he's on his way to Rome. He's on his reign, way to Rome because he had insisted as a Roman citizen in having a hearing with the, with the Caesar. In this case, it's Nero. Not the guy I want to go talk to. And the Bible tells us in the 27th chapter that they, they s sailed slowly for many days. That's verse 7. And, and with difficulty they had arrived at Sindus. And the, the wind was not permitting them to proceed. So there, were, there was very adversary conditions going on. And uh, verse 9 says they had... Verse 8 says, passing, they had passed Crete and with difficulty and amen. And in fact, this, this journey had begun to become very lengthy. It says in verse 9, much time had been spent. And now it was the time of year that sailing's dangerous. All right. 
And the Bible says at the end of verse 9 that Paul advised them. He said, he said, I perceive. Now, he, he was no count to him at this moment. He, he, he didn't care who this Paul. Are you a sailor, Paul? No, he, he had traveled much. He, in fact, he will make the statement in Corinthians that he had spent a day and a night in the deep. And he wasn't referring about a deep hole. Referring to water. So he had been, he's already experienced those kind of things. And so he had said to them, I perceive that this Voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo ship, but also our lives. But his words were unheeded. Nobody was listening to this man, uh, Paul. Hallelujah. And there were those that, you know, said, well, we need to, we need to move on. We need to, we need to, because this thing's all about making money, you see. We got to make money. And so, and so we're going to risk a further travel. Amen. And even after this crazy small Hebrew guy and says that we're, we're, we possibly are going to be facing disaster and the loss of our lives because where we're at right now, it's really not a suitable harbor. This is, this is not where we're going to have fun and games through the winter. We got to move on to somewhere that's much more profitable to us. Amen. Because the Bible says the harbor was not suitable to winter. And so, amen, in verse 12, it says the majority advise, okay, so the, the last part of the verse there. Amen. The majority advised in verse number 12. They, they advised that, yeah, they sail on. And so they had done that. Well, they sailed on and things seemed so inviting. A south wind was blowing softly. Hallelujah. Oh, man, if you, if you only understood some things. Again, some of us, we got problems because of how we're living all right. And we think just because a south wind is blowing, everything's okay. But I'm telling you, the wind can ch change quickly. And so the south wind is blowing, and it just seems like it's the conditions are right, and so they set sail. But verse 14 says it's not long, and there's a tempestuous headwind that called the Oracle, the Oracle done that, that rose up. Okay. Now, the, for you that. They didn't have engines in their boats, all right? They sailed with a sail, okay? So they're completely dependent upon the strength of the wind, okay? And so this headwind comes up, which means that they're fighting against this headwind. It comes up and it creates some problems. In fact, verse 15 says they were caught and could not get ahead into the wind. And so all they could do, now this, I know this, maybe if you're a sailor, you would understand. All they could do is just let it rot, let it drive, man. In other words, they had to give up fighting and they just let the wind take them where the wind was going to take them. And then they ran in, just, I, I'm, I'm laying this out, man. I'm going real slow for you. Okay, and so they are, they're running uh, uh, with this wind. And, and then they've secured, it says in verse 16, the skiff, which they would use to, to put their anchors. They've secured that with difficulty. And, and they've actually taken the time to undergird the ship with cables. But they, they, these are people that understand the sea. And, and they know this, this thing ain't over. Amen. And so they're, they're doing everything they know to do because they're fearful what could happen in, in just a little bit. And, amen. And then as they're, so they've, they've done all these things and, and, they, and they're afraid to run the ground. There are sands that could destroy them before they could even get close to the, uh, the shore. And so they, they had struck sail and they were so driven. Verse 18 tells us that there was an exceeding tempest tossed and what did they begin to do? They begin to do the thing they didn't want to do. They begin to lighten the ship. They begin to throw the prophet overboard. Because now it was a matter of, of life or death, you see. And, and we'd rather at least be alive. And so they begin to throw things overboard. They, they even threw the tackle overboard. Which suggests to me that they weren't interested, amen, in, 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 in any of the cargo. They just, they got, we got to lighten the ship because there's a possibility that we are going to go down. Verse 20 says that they did not see the sun nor the stars for many days. Now that doesn't mean a lot to us today with GPS and all that business. But these men lived by the stars and the sun and the moon. 
That's how they told direction. When you get away, somebody has been out in the water, when you don't see land, and it can get confusing if you don't have the proper uh, equipment to guide you. All right? And so they have no direction. They don't even know where they are at. And in verse 20, it says this, all hope, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. There had been a long abstinence from food. People don't feel like eating. They're struggling. Amen. It's just, it's not good. All right. And this, this Hebrew, this Jew, this prisoner. Are you, are you all with me? I'll put you all to sleep now. This, this, this prisoner stands up. And... He says to them in verse 22, I urge you to take heart. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that, what's, there he is, he's just, he's, that guy's goofy. For there would be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. Who does this guy think he is? All right. Verse 23 says, for there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. If you want the title to my message, I'll give it to you right now. It's good to be in a ship with a believer. It's good to be in a ship with somebody that believes God. It's good to be with somebody that prays. It's good to believe, amen, that somebody can actually have an angel of God come to them. It's good. It's good to be in a ship with a believer. Oh, hallelujah. 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 I'm in those circumstances. I don't want a bunch of unbelievers. I want somebody that believes God and knows how to pray. I want somebody that says, my God, I think we ought to have a prayer meeting right now. All right? I think we ought to get a hold of our God. You see, you may not value us right now. You may spit on us right now. You may even curse at us right now. But when you get in trouble and there's no way out, it's good to be in a ship with a believer. It's good to be with somebody that can pray, call on God. And when they call on God, the presence of God comes. It's good to be in that situation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh my God. Oh my God. You see, you, you may not count, you may not value prayer today. You may be foolish like I when, when I when when I was a kid that, that that stuff didn't matter. Amen. But I'm old now. And oh, it matters so much. I couldn't tell you the hours my parents prayed. It was evident by how they lived. In fact, if your house is a mess, it's evident that you ain't praying much. Let me run that by you again. Just, if your house is a mess, it's evident that you're not praying much. But I lived in a praying home. My God, it's good to be in a praying home with a mom and daddy to pray. It's good to be in a home where they actually believe the word of God. I remember one morning before church on a Sunday, the Jehovah Witnesses were out knocking on doors here in this area. Amen. And they'd come to, my, come to our house and my father, now he's got to get up, he's got to teach, he's going to preach that day. He invites them in. It wasn't long and they were on inviting themselves. We got to go. We got stuff we got to do. There's an atmosphere, man. There's an atmosphere. 
Hallelujah. An angel of the Lord stood by Paul and said, meet today, tonight. And, it, and, and I want to tell you something. I belong to God and, and I serve God. The times you have ridiculed your family because they suggested prayer. You know, you know, it's, I'm going to say this. In some of your homes, if somebody prays, you feel, you feel awkward. Or, or the atmosphere of the home changes. It's, it's an awkwardness. And I'll tell you why. Because it's not a godly home. Prayer should be natural in our homes. It should be like eating and sleeping and breathing. And if you were to read the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, there were 276 souls on that ship. And because there was a man that believed God and walked with God and served God, amen, will, even willing to go to Rome because he was a follower of Jesus Christ, every person on that ship would be saved. It's, it's, it's good to be in the ship with a believer. We, we sort of have this a tradition, I guess we could call it. When we go out to eat, all the time we go out to eat on a Sunday. You know, there's other ways. You're all welcome to come with us on Sunday out to eat. Now, I'm not paying your bill, but you're welcome to come. <laughs> and uh, we have this, this tradition. Whoever gets their meal first has to pray. Now, most of the time, it doesn't fall on me, but... Last Sunday you did. <laughs> now when I was a kid, to have somebody pray in a restaurant out loud would have made me nervous, made me feel ridiculous, made me feel like we're a bunch of idiots. But uh, I've come to realize it's good to be in a ship with a believer. I flat out just don't care anymore. You see, they, you see, they, they haven't been in the storms I've been in. But, but their storms are coming. How many of you, amen, when problems have come, somebody's asking you, would you pray? I'm telling you, they recognize it's good to be in a ship with a believer. Hallelujah. It's good to deal with issues with believers surrounding me, giving me godly advice and praying with me and encouraging me to do what's right and ethical and walk in righteousness. It's good even to be chastened by a believer who has my best interest at heart and the best interest of heart is not what my foolish emotions and mind want to do it's good to be in a ship with a believer Solomon in Ecclesiastes watched a man that was alone. Verse 8. He said, there was one alone without companion, he said. He has neither son nor brother. Uh, he, uh, yet he continues to labor, it tells us in, in verse 8. And he, uh, his eyes, he's, he, he just, he's, he's accumulating all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And he, but he, but he, he's alone. He, he, he never asked. He never asked for help. He never, he just, uh, in fact, he has nobody to uh, give all the stuff that he has accumulated. So all his toil and all his efforts really amount to vanity. Nothing. That's what he saw. No relatives, nobody. Oh, it was profit, but only profit for himself. Only profit for himself. Only profit for himself. My God, if that's, if that's how you live, if it's just about you, you're like the man that Solomon's talking about. You don't, you don't, you don't involve anybody else in your life. You just, it's all about me. It's all about me. What, what, what a poor way to live. I'm here to tell you, at the, at, the end, at the end of everything, it's just vanity. It's nothing. 
And so this is, this is how he, in, in Ecclesiastes, he's, he's telling us in verse 4, and then he begins, it, it goes from that and he begins to look at some other things. And he says in verse 9, he says, two are better than one. Because there is a good reward for their labor. When it comes to working, it's good to have somebody that's working alongside of you. Good to have somebody just sharing the sweat with you. In fact, you can progress a whole lot farther when a guy next to you is working just as hard as you're working. You know, it's difficult when you got a tough job. And you know it's a tough job and there ain't nobody alongside of you that can say, Hey, Leo. We'll get this thing done, man. I know it looks right now like, my God, we'll never get it done. We're going to get this thing done. We're going to do this thing. You know, it's better. Two are better than one, ladies and gentlemen. They're better. There's a good reward for labor. Amen. Okay, I'm just meddling all over the house today. So, so husband and wife, two is better than one. Two... Is better than one. Working together can get it done. I like that. Two's better than one. Working together can get it done. All right. And then he goes on to say, For if they fall, I want my mama to. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who was alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. You see, two are better than one when you're walking life. Two are better than one. You see, in Palestine, they, they have paved streets. And, and I could take the time today to tell you some of the streets in Kenosha. My God, they're becoming... Well, anyways. Anyways. But there were no paved streets in, in Palestine, so things weren't level. And, and, and the older I get, the more I understand this. There are times that I, have, I take a fall, man. In fact, I took a fall a couple of years ago, and I was all out there by myself. And then my glasses went that direction, and my, my case went that direction. And I'm laying on the pavement, and it's, my head hurts, and I'm crawling trying to get to my, to my feet. And... I gather myself. I can see in the building. There's people. Nobody saw. Nobody saw me fall. I'm hurting. Amen. And so I get in my car and I call my wife and I say to her, "Honey, I fell. I may have a concussion. I'm on my way home." <laughs> yeah. See, nuts. Well, did, did you, by the way, I never asked. Did you pray for me while I was? She says, "Oh no." No, that's, that's not true. I know she prayed for me. You see, you see the, the influence of godly people praying when you ain't feeling so good and you're, I'm telling you, that, that was one of the, okay, this, this indicts me. I, I might as well tell you what I was going to say. One of the times I actually was probably going a little bit under the speed limit and, hold, and held the right lane, just wanted to just make sure I got home carefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. I got home. Thank God. It's good to be in a ship with a believer. Now, we can fall in the natural realm, you know. But what do we do when we stumble and fall in the spiritual realm? What do we do when we have cut ourselves off from believers? And we just going to do our own little thing and try to somehow walk with God alone. And now when we've fallen, you know, it, it's hard sometimes to get up, you see. And because there's a voice that starts talking to you, Sister Cinda, that says, you're a dirty dog, and God don't want you to talk to him anymore. Okay, and, and unfortunately, sometimes, as much as I know that's a lie, when I'm down and I can't see clearly, I begin to buy into it. What do you do? 
You see, it's good to be in the ship with believers. It's good. You know, Paul would say in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burden, so fulfill the law of Christ. Two is better than one. When, I, when I'm down, I, I want the hand of a believer. Well, I don't need you to tell me how sinful I've been. I already realize that. But I need you to say, son, you, you can walk with God. You, know, you can get up. You can live for God. God is going to forgive you. I'm not going to hold it against you. You know, it, it's good to be in a ship with with believers. It's good to be it's good to be with believers that that, that realize, you see, two's better than one. Some of us are trying to walk with God as hermits and we close ourselves off. I'm here to tell you, two's better than one. He, he would go on and say again, if if you two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Now for you fuzzy folks today amen it's palestine it gets cold at night and amen the the inn you came to was not a uh helton it was some uh some home some inn uh you may if it's crowded may just end up sleeping out in the stable you know and that guy you're traveling with hey buddy you know you're just my buddy now i'm just getting closer because you're my buddy let me make that clear. You are my buddy, all right? I just, you got to say stuff different in this world than you used to be able to say, you know? And, uh, and so, you know, he creates heat, I create heat, and, and, we're, and we're comfortable. Now, 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 you could bring your nice big blanket with you and your pillow and all that stuff, but you know what? That means that you're a little bit more weighted down in your journey, you see? So two is better than one when you're out there and you need warmth hallelujah then he says though one may be overpowered by another two can withstand him and a threefold cord is not quickly broken mm. Mm. in uh at uh, Friday at the wake, uh, Ralph, Ralph got up and he was talking. Now, both Ralph and Tony were real, real short, man. They are the kind of guys that people like to pick on. I mean, they're short. Okay, and so Ralph got up there and they, he said they've been practicing in their basement. You know, practicing, probably fighting. And, amen. And then they were somewhere and sure enough, it got on. And, and Ralph said, I just said, this is just back to back, man. Just back to back. You know. They're all tough when you're fighting them alone. But let somebody else step up there and get his back. and We'll see how big your mouth is going to carry you, Jack. You want to pick on me because I'm weaker than you. Well, now I got my brother here. You know, and there's two that are better than one. Hey, Amen. You, you may overcome me, but I got Bubba here. <laughs> And he knows judo. <laughs> Hallelujah. Two's better than one. Then he says, a threefold cord is not easily broken. I, I, I think he didn't have numbers in mind when he got to that threefold cord there. I think he was talking about a unity of a woven cord. You're going to have a hard time breaking that thing. Now, now you'll notice, I, I don't have time to go back to verse 8, it was 1. Verse 9, it went to 2. And verse 12, it's up to 3. It's good to be in the ship with believers. Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 4, my God, I'm getting close to the end here. Amen, I get the end of my time. Amen, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called okay, how, how was I called what was I called to with all lowliness and gentleness with long suffering bearing with one another in love endeavoring everybody say endeavoring 
to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. You see, in this ship we're on, ladies and gentlemen, we don't need a mutiny. Because if we have a mutiny, we may not get there. And the storm's a tough storm. And so somehow, all your little concepts about it ought to be, you got to throw them out the window. And we have one objective. Save the ship and everybody on board the ship. Saying, it's good to be in a ship with believers. Are, are you with me? Yeah. See, I, I, I'm, the word of God, it's walking us today. It's talking to us. All right. I, I'm here to tell you, you cannot separate yourself from other believers and think that you're going to be strong. You may have a form. But it says in the Bible, Bill, where two or three are gathered together in his name. So it just takes you and me getting together in his name and there he is in the midst of us. Hallelujah. It's good to be in a ship with a believer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, when I start talking about the things of God, the unbeliever sort of rolls his eyes and says, he's a little goofy. But when I can hook up with another believer and we start sort of preaching a sermon to each other <laughs> and we're saying, oh, amen, brother. Hallelujah, brother. Oh, that's good, brother. Amen. Let's pray right now. And we start praying. It's good to be in a ship with a believer. Hey, you tell the apostle Peter that. Do it by yourself, Peter. They already killed James. Herod says, hey man, they, they really like me knocking off these apostles here. Oh, there's that. We got that Peter guy locked up. We're going to cut his head off. And Peter's down in the innermost part of the prison. And he's sleeping. <laughs> he's sleeping. All right, he's sleeping. Amen. Why? Because... When you're a believer, you may be sleeping, but not every believer is sleeping. Somebody's praying. Somebody's praying, Virginia. Somebody's praying. Hallelujah. It's, it's good to be in a ship with, with a believer, you see. And so, he gets hit on the side, looks up, and he says, my God, that looks like an angel. Get up, put your shoes on. Okay, so he gets up, puts his shoes on. He walks out of, he's way down deep in there. He goes to the second ward, the first ward, and then he finds himself going through the iron gate. The gate opens up, and there ain't a guard there that pulls it back. He just, he just walks out. Gets out on the street, and my God, I thought this was a great vision. I'm actually out on the street. And see, so you know where he goes? Now, you know, y'all want to say, well, he was just led of the Spirit to go to the home of John Mark's mother. No. He knew where believers would get together and pray. And so he goes to where believers are praying. I'm telling you. When they want your life and when they want to kill you, and when they're trying to destroy everything that's good in you, it's good to know that you can be in the ship with other believers. All right, now, it's going to put your helmets on here. Now, there are homes in this room where it's a home that has unbelievers in it also. And sometimes those homes become a war zone, you know. And sometimes they ridicule you because you pray and because you believe God and they, they attack you for your beliefs and they don't make you feel so good. And sometimes when you're laying there in your bed at night, you're wishing, my God, I wish she dropped dead or I wish he dropped dead. We have a nice funeral home, a funeral for him, and then we just move on. Yeah. Oh, my God. I, I hit I hit it I hit it you don't understand what I'm saying you think removing the problem 
is a solution. So the Apostle Paul is confronted with this. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, verse 12, But to the rest, I, I, not the Lord, say, If any brother has a wife who does not believe, and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he's willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. It's the word of the Lord. And then he, and then he tells us, oh man, some of you are shutting down because... Because, see, that's what you thought the solution was. All right? Verse 14 says, For if the unbelieving husband, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, otherwise your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. You see, what, what I'm trying to tell you right now what I'm trying to tell you right now, what I'm trying to get through to you right now, son, it's good to be in a ship with believers. That's what I'm trying to tell you right now, son. It's good to be in a ship with, with a believer. Because you see, what you brought into the home was God's influence. That husband, that wife may not be interested in serving God, but you bring the influence of a God into that home. Not only does it impact the husband and wife, but you've got your little kitties in there. Okay? And we get so stinking selfish because it's all about us that we ignore what's happening to our kids when we go through a divorce. You see, divorce is not God's solution. That's man's solution. Now, it did say if they want to leave you, well, you're not giving up Jesus. Yeah. You all was dancing a little bit ago. I I'm preaching to you right now. I'm, I'm trying to tell you that there there's a way to work these things out. It's good to be in a ship with a believer. When you're facing crud and junk and garbage, it's good to join another believer. Not to complain about your conditions, but to ask, would you strengthen me? Would you pray with me? Would you believe with me that God's going to work? Hallelujah. Instead of running from God, run to God. Instead, instead of shutting yourself down, open yourself up to God. Instead of saying, I'm going to walk very quietly in my home. No, you, you pray. You seek God. You get filled with the Holy Ghost in your home. You speak in tongues. You don't care if they hear you. I know if I'd have been on that ship with Paul, and when he says, I, I serve God, and he says, and the angel came, I, boy, I'd be making Paul my best friend. Whatever you do, Paul, that's what I'm doing, buddy. Whatever you do, that's what I'm doing. You, you got to understand, you see, you see, what you're trying to do, what you have molded into your life is a philosophy that's not from heaven. You are trying to adapt into your life the philosophy of this world. And you think that the philosophy of this world is going to produce happiness and joy for you. What's it done for you? It's produced more problems. You see, unfortunately, I wish to say we'd all learn the first time, but for most of us, it takes multiple times before we ever figure it out. And, and so it would really be good to be in a ship with a believer that could say to you, Mark, is this decision you're fixing to make right now is about the craziest decision I've ever heard. You see, what we're producing, what we're pursuing is to be happy. That's why those boys didn't want to stay in Fair Havens. They wanted to be happy. Where do you get happy? Not in Fair Havens. 
There ain't no girls here. There ain't a nice bar here. There ain't, there ain't the kind of stuff we want. It's a little rugged here, and we know where there's a harbor where ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> And all the time, the Apostle Paul shaking his head. My God, guys, do you understand where this ship going? It's never going to see a release of its cargo if you don't hear God. It's good. So you see, so I'm, I'm, let me just, my God, I, I, it's, can I go? It's 46. I could stop right now. I could stop right now. I know some of you would have me to stop. When we try to give you advice, we're not trying to waste our breath, ladies and gentlemen. When other godly men and women try to give you advice, they're not trying to waste their breath with you. But the thing I've learned is I can't figure it out for you. I can, I can tell you what you need to do, but I know that you've got to be willing to do it. And if you're not willing to do it, well then, when you're sinking, I'll reach out my hand to help you. But I can't live your life. It was a hard time for me to learn that, Marcy, that I can't live anybody's life for them. I can tell them what's right, but they got to do what's right. And I want to be in a ship with believers who will speak to me and say, Mark, you're off today. You're, you're, you, ain't, you ain't right, man. There's something wrong with you. And I want to be big enough to say, you know, you may be right. Who are you to tell me what, what's right and what's wrong? <laughs> Hackles come up, you know. Come on, come on, you say that. Yeah, that happens. Oh, you may not say a word to me, but I immediately saw the wall go up in you. Immediately saw you shut down. Immediately saw your countenance change, and I knew I couldn't reach you. Because you got the way, all right, baby. You got it all saw. That's why you got all that trouble. I'm here to tell you it's good to be in a ship with a believer. It's good to be with a believer who's going to tell me the truth. And God, give me the grace and the strength to do what they tell me to do. <laughs> you know, I just, I just, just the sailors were going to slip off the ship and leave all the landlubbers on board. And so they were lowering the skiff in the pretense of setting the anchors. And Paul says to the soldiers, them boys ain't planning on coming back. And if they don't come back, we're all going to be lost. And if you read in the 27th chapter, you know what the soldiers do? They cut the ropes. There goes the skiff. Now ain't nobody getting off the ship. We're all either going to make it or we're all going to drown. See, it's good to be in a ship with a believer. I am coming to a close now. So the Apostle Paul will go on into Rome and there he will be tried by Nero. And uh, first time he'll be released and then he comes back again. And uh, he now knows it's sunset. So he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering and time of my departure is at hand. I know this is it. I know. I know this is it. He said, I fought a good fight and I've finished the race and I've kept the faith. And finally there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will give me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who love his appearing. Hallelujah. And then he puts the pen down. And he's sitting there for a while. I'm ready to meet God, but what about the believers here? Oh, what about the believers I haven't seen in a while? So he says to Timothy, Timothy, be diligent to come to me quickly. Come quickly. I don't know how long, much longer I'm going to be alive. And then he says this, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and he has departed for Thessalonica. Christians is gone, and Titus is in Demacia. Only Luke is with me. Hey, get John Mark and bring him for he's profitable to me for ministry. See, when you get to the end, it's good to look up in that haze you may be in and see the people that are sitting with you. 
is somebody speaking in tongue. Somebody that's smiling at you say, oh my God, you know what's going to happen here. Hallelujah, you're going home, brother. I know. You see, it's good to be in a ship with believers. When I get to the end of this thing, it's good to be in a ship with believers. I told you that was that's not the end, sorry. Like most preachers, I just lean you on. <laughs> One of the greatest feats that I read in the scripture is not done by the Egyptians or the Romans. It's done by a band of Israelites who have come home to a devastated city. Walls burned, or the gates burned, walls down. And a man walks among them named Nehemiah. And he tells him, my purpose for being here is to build the walls and hang the gates. The city's in ruin. Not for long. One of the most, one of the greatest building adventures you'll read is in Nehemiah. It's thousands of workers in the in the, the it's a difficult task, but they just stay at it. If you want to read Nehemiah, you'll find multiple adversaries, Tobiah and Sam Ballad and all those characters are they they just don't want any good thing to happen to you, you see. And they want to destroy you. Sounds like the devil to me. And so you're trying to build a life for God today in your home, your family. You're trying to build a life for God in this body. You're trying to build the kingdom of God in this city. Well, we got adversaries, ladies and gentlemen. We got adversaries. We got those that don't want to see us flourish and prosper. They don't want to see, amen, this, this apostolic faith church grow. They don't, they don't want to see. They don't want to see that. You have people that baptize in Jesus' name and believe in the oneness of God, speaking in tongues. They don't want to see that happen. We got adversaries. Now, I'm not suggesting we approach everybody in an adversarial position, but I'm just telling you, we have adversaries. And so did Nehemiah. Somebody comes and says, you know, they're plotting against you. You know, they're, they're examining all your weaknesses. I got plenty. <laughs> Salmon on. And they're looking for that place to come in. Okay, and Nehemiah thanks him. Thank you for telling me that this is their plan. They've, they're, they're coming to destroy us. Ten times they've come against us. So what did Nehemiah do? Well, he went over in the corner and he cried a lot. and Told everybody how bad it was. And nobody loved him, everybody hated him, and nobody understood him. My God, God put me in this place. What was God thinking? It's terrible. Why did he go and single me out? I was perfectly fine in Shushan, taking the wine to the king. Now here I am in this mess. Oh, come on. You know how your whining sounds to God? You know how your whining sounds to others? Do you know why they step away from you when you're whining? Because they're tired of your whining. <laughs> why don't you talk about God? You'll draw a crowd. You see, it's good to be in a ship with believers. And when believers start talking about God... It draws other people. It may even draw a few believers that are a little confused. And so, what's he do? He, he positions men. Okay? In those weak spots. And I, I am coming to a close. I really am. In verse 18 of Nehemiah 4, the Bible says that every one of the builders 
had his sword girded at his side as he built. And then it says in verse 18, And the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. This is Nehemiah saying this. There's a guy right next to him. What's he got? He's got a trumpet. What's the purpose of the trumpet? What's the purpose of the trumpet? You see, it's good to be in a ship with believers. And sometimes the ship's so vast, what we're dealing with is so vast, that they're not, I can't see them, you see. They're out of sight. Okay? They're out of sight. And so he says in verse 20, let's stand this morning, he says in verse 20, This is Nehemiah talking. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, it doesn't say rally to me. It says rally to us. There our God will fight for us. You see, it's good to be in a ship with a believer. When you're in trouble and you blow the trumpet and you didn't see him. He had been down in the hold somewhere out of sight and all of a sudden his head popped up over him. Ah, there he is. He come up the rope and he just walked over to you. So I'm here, brother. And all of a sudden the guy came swinging down from the, up in the sails. He landed right next to you. Heard the trumpet man. I heard the trumpet. Here, man. You see, it's good to be in a ship with believers. I'm here to tell you that if your heart is honest and you want to change and that you're willing to change. And you ask other believers to help you. They ain't going to run away from you. They're going to run to you. Because hmm. you see, it's good to be in the ship with a believer. I can't do nothing about the storms. I can't change the wind's direction. I can't chain the devil in this world. He's going to get chained. It's coming. Can't do those things. But there's one thing I can do. That when a believer blows a trumpet, I can come and pray. You know what? I'll tell you, I'll tell you right now. Listen to me carefully. You pray hard. I'll pray hard. You listen hard, I'll speak hard. If it really don't matter to you, then why did you blow the trumpet? Why did you blow the trumpet if it really didn't matter to you? You see, it's good to be in the ship with a believer. All right, we are, we are closing now. I, I, I've, I, got, I got everything closed here. All right, right now, somebody close to you, step over by them, and I want you to pray for that believer.